good to see you this morning, bright and early, bright and early, you feel it? You feel a little bit? Yeah, me too. I uh, was in Honduras this week and got back last night. I was supposed to get back at about eight o'clock and uh, my pilot got sick and they had to replace our pilot. Anyway, I sat in Houston for about five hours last night unexpectedly and so got in about midnight and then when I got at the house, I was like, wait a minute, it's not midnight. It's like 1 a.m., isn't it? And uh, I was like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Uh, but it is good to be with you. We saw God move very powerfully in Honduras this week. Our team is still on the ground and uh, had some powerful meetings, uh, equipping of pastors, had a wonderful Friday night service where the Lord just came into the room in a way um, that, that can, is unmistakably God. Um, do you know what I mean when I say that? Unmistakably, God, just things begin to happen that don't make sense. People getting healed, their bodies being healed, people being radically delivered. Um, just the, the, the number one thing I see when, uh, or the number one manifestation that I just know it's God is when lots of people begin to cry. It's hard to work that up, if you know what I mean. And um, the, the, the fear of the Lord came in the room and people begin to weep, people begin to fall. People ask me, why do people fall down? Have you ever, have you ever wondered that? Why do people fall down? It's simple, because they can't stand up. <laughs> it, it's not like you need this biblical, you know, it's not like you need this verse. Because every time someone was in the presence of an angel or presence of the Lord, they hit the deck. And so sometimes when God comes into the room in a special way, people fall, people cry, and also miracles break out. And I think that the, it was commonplace in Scripture, and I think it should be commonplace in church. I think it should be common. I think it should be a common thing. It shouldn't be uncommon. It should be common. And I think it's going to become more common as the day of his approaching draws nearer. I believe that we are getting nearer to the day of his approach. Um, which is kind of least, I had a little introduction, but I'm not going to give it. Let's just go. Um, uh, I was with the Lord last week, and I said, what, what, what are some things that are on your heart? What do you want to talk about? What's, what's a topic that we need to discuss? And, and I heard this phrase from the Lord. I just heard it. I heard it in my spirit. And this is what the Lord said. He said, it's time to get serious. Has anybody ever told you that before? It's time to get serious. You know, before a game... Maybe all the players are in the locker room cutting up, you know, having a good time, and that's absolutely fine. But there comes a point as the game is about to start that the, the mood shifts in the room. It's no more cutting up. It's no more jokes. It's, hey, it's time to get serious. We're about to go out there and compete. Maybe it's another event in life. You know, I've, I've, I've been in hospital rooms before, before surgery, before somebody goes back to surgery and the family's in the room and there's cutting up and there's, there's laughing and there's, and there's conversations. And then the nurse comes in the room and says, hey, the doctor will be here in about five minutes. And all of a sudden the mood in the room shifts from laughing and cutting up to maybe crying to maybe silence. Like, hey, we're about to have a serious moment and it's time to get serious. It's time to get serious. Maybe you've said that to your children before. I've said, that. hey, that's enough. Time to get serious. It's time to get serious. And, and what we mean by that comment is our attention and our focus, maybe in this case, our devotion needs to be centered on the only one who matters. The one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come very soon. And I think that God is calling his bride into a posture of being serious. Now, that doesn't mean that we walk around all serious all the time. But I think you know what I mean. It's time to get serious about this. We're seeing God's activity all over the earth. We're seeing God break out in high schools. We're seeing God break out in colleges and universities. We're seeing God break out in especially other parts of the world. I have the opportunity to travel often, and I wish you did too. I wish I could take you with me everywhere I go. I wish I could take you with me to Honduras this week. When God stepped into the room, I'm like, a, a way I've ever seen before. I wish I could take you with me to India. I wish I could take you with me to Brazil and to Africa and to India. God is doing things. 
Like Muslims are having dreams of Jesus and radically being saved. Hindus are being healed in their bodies and radically delivered. And they're giving their life to Christ. Um, Hispanics and Latin Americans and South Americans are having encounters with God that are absolutely abnormal. It's time for America to get serious. God's moving. And hey, listen, we're in an open door of opportunities. A Kairos moment is what it's called in Scripture. It's an opening and shutting window of opportunity. I believe that God is offering the church right now to partner with him in what he's doing. We can participate and see the things that the other parts of the world are seeing, or we can just sit on our hands and tell jokes. And I can give you three points on the, how, how to have a better marriage and five points on how to have better finances and three points on how, how God can bless your business. Or we can get a little serious. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see some of the things that God is doing in other parts of the world. I think one of the things that God wants to restore, not only to Christians, but to the corporate body, is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. So what I'm going to talk about today is the fear of the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. It's not in your notes, but you can write this reference down. And I, I would highly suggest you look up every reference that I mention. Don't ever, take, don't ever take what someone tells you for truth. Like you, you, should, you should do due diligence every time you hear a message to make sure I'm on track. The only way that people get led astray, I want you to hear this, the only way that people get led astray is because they don't do their homework. So we have congregations all over the world being led astray, and it's not the pastor's fault. It's the hearer's fault. You have a Bible. So check it. Check me on all of this. But in Philippians chapter 2, there's a verse in verse 12 that says, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, the way that your salvation comes into maturity is to establish a holy fear with trembling of the Lord. This is how salvation comes into maturity. Without fear, as we're about to read. When, if you don't have a healthy fear of the Lord, you're, not only will your salvation not mature, but you are in a high percentage or high likelihood of falling away from the faith. Where there is no fear of God, there is backsliding and falling away. Hebrews talks about this, Romans talks about this, Jesus talks about this. The number one reason that people fall away from the faith, and you can fall away from the faith. You can fall away from God. You can lose your salvation. This once saved, always saved mentality that is not doctrine it is not bible it is heresy the scriptures talk about a great apostasy in the end times people falling away from faith hebrews talks about people falling away from faith so just because god started it doesn't mean that it's automatically yours forever you can give it back and so many people have a God experience at some point in their life. They get a warm and fuzzy and they say a prayer and they think, all right, I'm good. See you in heaven. Nope. Jesus said there will be many on that day who say, Lord, Lord, did I not say a prayer? Did I not go to church? Did I not give some money? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you know who's going to be in that category? A bunch of church folk. A bunch of pastors. A bunch of Bible study teachers. Who mistook knowledge of God for knowing God. We must 
preach messages like this if we want to be good pastors, good shepherds, good leaders. There's too much warm and fuzzy, and there should be some warm and fuzzy. Take serious the kindness of God, but also the severity of God. There are two sides of God. There is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. His love, his mercy, his goodness, his faithfulness. He's a happy God. He's a good father. Aren't you glad? But there is also a side of him that is holy and reverent and severe. And when you take note of it, your posture is not nonchalant. It is fall on your face and pray that you don't die. Fear has an important role to play in your faith. In Romans chapter 11, turn there and look at it. Romans chapter 11, you should read Romans. Every Christian should read Romans. Every Christian should read the book of Romans and spend adequate time there. Most of the doctrine that we have in the local church came from Romans. Paul's unpacking things here that God has revealed to him in the secret place, that Jesus has revealed to him the mysteries of the kingdom, the mysteries of God. So Paul's writing to this church in Rome that he has not yet visited, and, and what he's doing here is he's writing ahead of them to give them a solid doctrinal foundation before he comes and preaches. Wonderful theology in Romans. And in verse 25, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the mysteries of God because if you do, you will become proud. Three times in Romans, Paul warns the Gentiles. He's talking to the Gentiles. This is the non-Jewish church that he's talking to. He warns them, don't become proud. Now, when I hear it and you hear it, we immediately think, okay, don't become proud. Don't think too much of yourself. That's one side of pride. But the biblical side of pride is not just thinking too much of self. It's not thinking enough about God. It's not thinking highly enough of God. That is pride. When you don't see God as God is to be seen, pride slips in. Pride seeks to undermine your faith. This is what Paul is going to talk about. Pride seeks to take you down. Pride comes before the fall. There's so many verses that talk about pride. Pride, being focused on self, not being focused on God, sets you up for failure in this life and the life to come. So he's telling them, listen, the salvation that's being offered to you was a gift. You didn't even deserve it. Like if you're not a Jew and you're saved, you should celebrate. This is what he's saying. This first covenant was not made to Gentiles, it was made to Jews. But because the Jews rejected the Messiah, God opened the gospel to the Gentiles. God made this decision. I'm gonna open this up to the Gentiles. I'm gonna open this up to people that are not my people. And he says, you should thank God for that, that he made that decision. You should thank God for the fact that you have been grafted in. We are non-deserving from the outside, looking in. God in his mercy grafted us into his family by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God has extended to you his hand. And personally, he saved you from hell. He saved you from death. He saved you from a wretched, horrible, ridiculous life filled with fear, filled with torment of the devil. He reached down and snatched you out of the pit. And you should be thankful every single day. If you're not thankful, if you don't worship him, if you don't praise him for what he's done, you will become proud. And you'll think subconsciously, you won't voice it because you never would, but you'll think that somehow you deserved it. Well, I've done this and I've done that. I preach and I travel all around the world and I do this. No, 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 no. 
Even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. None of us deserve it. So he says, be thankful. And now listen, look at what he's about to say. Live your life. Live your life. The life that you have been given in such a way that it reflects the gratitude of the kindness of God, but also fear and trembling in knowing who he is. Gratitude and fear. Because if you don't, there is a spirit that is alive and active. Don't think that you're immune. Don't think that you're off limits. I don't care how you live. There's a spirit that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Wants to take it from you. Well, I just don't believe if my salvation can be taken from me. Well, read the Bible. Well, I grew up being taught. I don't care who taught you. I don't care if it was your daddy, your grandmama, your mama. I don't care who told you that. If God didn't tell you that. Mark 13, 13. Write this one down. Mark 13, 13. Jesus said, only those who endure to the end will be saved. What what in the world is that supposed to mean? Exactly what it says. Your faithfulness to the end. So does that mean the last 10 years I could get tripped up and something could get stolen from me? Yes, you could live 70 years of faithfulness. But in your last 10 years, if you give it back, you're toast. Good morning. I love you enough to tell you this. Jesus didn't say, hey, those that get out of the gates well and off to a a good start, they will get salvation. Doesn't matter how you start. Those who said a prayer one time in their life when they were serious about me, but, but straight away, they'll be saved. Nope. Those who go to church every Sunday, they'll be saved. No, you can't, you, can't go to, you can't partner with God on Sunday and partner with the devil the other six days of the week and expect. I mean, come on. It's time to get serious. Do you believe what's in the Bible? Have you read it? Matthew 24, write that down. Read the whole chapter. Hebrews 5 and 6, write that down. Read those chapters. So Paul in love is writing to this church and saying, listen, I'm so glad that God has done something in your life. But my job is not just to celebrate the thing that he did. My job is to make sure that you endure with faithfulness all the way to the end. So that when you stand before God, you'll hear the the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done, you didn't get tripped up. Well done, you didn't get snagged. Well done, you didn't get deceived. You didn't get deceived. You didn't get caught up in the world. You didn't make your life about business and money and selfish gain. You didn't fall for those tricks. You saw clearly the words that my son said. You saw clearly and you took it Seriously. You took it seriously. Well done, good and faithful servant. All right, let's read the text. Romans 11, verse 20. It says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. He's talking about the, the, the Jews. But you stand by faith. Do not be haughty. Do not become proud, but what? Fear. Fear God. Well, pastor, there's so many many passages of scripture that tell me to fear not. There's actually 365 verses that tell you fear not. But you know that there are equal as many that tell you fear God. 
I'll show you another verse in a minute where Jesus clears this up. He talks about what you should not fear, and he tells you what you should fear. Because there, listen, there are some things in life that you should fear. You should fear electricity. Yes? You should, you should fear 16-year-old drivers. Yes? Oh, I fear them. Every time I get in the car with them. Scared to death. There are some things in life that you should fear. If you don't have healthy fear, you'll become arrogant. People get hurt. People get electrocuted. Mistakes happen when they lose respect. Fear God. For if God did not spare the natural branches, his own people, well, he's not going to spare you either. Therefore, consider the kindness or the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell Look at that. On those who fell, on those who fell away, and those who did not persist, severity. But toward you, goodness, if, everybody say if. Everybody say if. If you continue in his goodness, you've got to continue. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. That doesn't sound like once saved, always saved. (laughs) The kindness of God leads you to repentance. But what Paul's saying here, it's the fear of God that keeps you there. What is the fear of the Lord? It simply means to reverence, awe, and respect him for who he is. To consider all aspects of him, both the kindness side. And listen, I get that. I think we've preached that. We've talked about the goodness of God. He is good. He's not angry. He's not upset. He's not holding the lightning rod waiting for you to mess up. He's not like your earthly father who is imperfect. He is perfect in all of his ways. And Jesus told many parables to illustrate the goodness and the kindness and the love of God. Did he not? Just go read the prodigal son about 55 times. If you you forget for a moment how good God is, just go read that story. That guy didn't deserve it. No? No, he didn't. That's your father. He is good. But there is also a part of your father that should be awed and respected and honored And Paul is saying, this fear that needs to be in your life. I don't know about you, but I grew up fearing my dad. (laughs) He loved me, but there was a part of him that kept me in check. I'll never forget, like it was yesterday, I was mouthing off to my mom, and I didn't know my dad was home. (laughs) And I came around the corner, and before I knew it, my feet were off the ground, and I was up against a wall. With a hand right here. He said, who are you talking to? I know you're not talking to your mother. I couldn't even talk. I was like, I was 17 years old. 17 years old. He said, do you think you can talk to her that way? I was like, that was a mistake. (laughs) And I'll never do it again. Listen, like we need that in our life. I'm not condoning abuse. Don't hear me say that. And it was not abusive. I need moments like that in my life. I've had moments like that from my dad. I've had moments like that from several bosses. I have one guy called me everything but a child of God. Because I was being a selfish little turd. And I needed to be told that because I was. So Paul is saying, listen, fear plays an important area, really two things. It plays a role in the preservation of your faith. And it also plays a role in the proximity of your relationship with him. There's so many, just, just Google search fear of God verses. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like, go read all of the Proverbs that talk about the fear of the Lord. Like, those have not been abolished because we're now in a new covenant. Jesus said, I didn't come to get rid of the old covenant. I came to fulfill it. Meaning that stuff is still very, very helpful for us. So the fervency of revival, the fervency of your relationship with God, and the longevity of your faith is dependent upon a healthy fear of the Lord. Jesus clears up what fear, healthy fear and unhealthy fear looks like. Matthew 10, 28. It says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We just don't read verses like that enough. And I know, listen, I know it's not popular. And, and listen, if you're new to the faith and you're trying to figure all of this out, I understand that this might not be the best first message. <laughs> I don't know, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. Because I think we kind of, we kind of, I think sometimes in the church we kind of lure people in with shenanigans and tricks. And then about six months in, they hear a message like this and they're like, I don't know if I signed up for this. Well, if you signed up, this is what you signed up for. I mean, I'm dead serious. If you want your life to be saved, like if you want, I mean, we have to understand what this really is. This is not just sprinkling Jesus on our life. This is, this is an exchange. This is an exchange. You are exchanging your dead, hopeless, pathetic life. And wasn't it? Yeah, it is, if you just look at it. You're exchanging that life for a new one that he's going to give you. But listen, it's not just, it's not just free. Salvation is free, but it will also cost you everything. Like everything. Jesus said, consider the cost. If anyone wants to be my disciple, they must crucify themselves. So Jesus said, listen, don't, don't fear, don't fear man, don't fear sickness and disease, you know, don't, don't fear the devil in anything the devil is doing. Because God made him and he's going to take care of him one day. Who should you fear? You should fear the Lord. This is what Jesus said. All right, so I'm going to give you some manifestations or indications of what it might look like for a person who does not fear God. And then I'll give you a really simple answer as how can I be a person that respects, honors, reverences, fears the Lord, okay? So here's, here's some indications that you might not be where you need to be in this camp. Number one, you lack honor and reverence toward God. You lack honor and reverence toward God. Psalm chapter 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. You will never find God in an atmosphere where he is not honored and respected. About two years ago, I went to another nation teach and preach in an event. I was really hyped up about it because I'd heard that the worship and the, the move of the Spirit was very powerful in that region, in that area. I had high expectation. I expected passionate worship. I expected tangible presence of God. But when I arrived, I was surprised. Worship started, but the room felt cold and dead. Lifeless. I was like, well buzzkill what in the world and I said God where are you and God said turn around and I turned around and I looked and this is what I saw these people are worshiping their hearts out but these people Hmm, 
It's interesting. Talking to one another, hands in pockets, arms crossed. And God told me, where I am not reverenced and worshiped, I will not be found. On the flip side of that, I recently went to a place where as soon as I walked in the room, the presence of the Lord hit me. I was asked to take off my shoes to come into the worship center. And I said, oh, is this like a cultural thing? It's like, no, it's a God thing. It's like, well, off they come. And when I entered, there were people, listen, the service hadn't even started yet. This was about 30 minutes before the service. There were people on the ground, crying, praying, wailing. There were people at the altar. Like God didn't wait for the band to start playing before he showed up. He felt the draw from the hearts of the people in the room. Service hadn't even started. When it did, oh my goodness. <laughs> it was like the, the room was saturated with gasoline and the Holy Spirit just went. <sighs> <laughs> that was a bad illustration. Maybe strike of a match. <laughs> strike of a match. <laughs> there, that's better. I don't know why I thought of that. Maybe I should be prayed for. All right. I've watched too many movies. That's what it is. There was just such a reverence and awe and fear of the Lord. And God was pleased with it. You know, he really was. Isaiah 11, 2 through 3. I want to show, I want to show you where Jesus himself practiced this principle. And this is where it gets weird because even though he was God, he feared God. In his humanity, he knew that in order to model correctly and do what God had, the Father had called him to do, he had to respect the Father, reverence the Father, and fear the Father. All right, so look at this. This is Isaiah 11. I hope you're writing these down. You should read them. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. This is talking about the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord will rest. This is the seven spirits of the Lord. Anybody ever heard of teaching on the seven spirits of the Lord? Okay. This is the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and, and fear of the Lord. And of all of those spirits, look, look at the one that he delights in. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. It, 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 made, it made special reference to note that he's, he really delights in that one. He delights in that one. Jesus delighted... In somebody's alarm's going off. Just check your thing. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. So here's my question. Should his delight not be our delight? All right, Hebrews 5, 7. Look at this. This is interesting. Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with adamant cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his godly fear. The reason that the father listened to the prayers of Jesus wasn't, look at this, it wasn't because he prayed, it wasn't because he cried, it was because he feared the Lord. I wanna say this, you can make a lot of noise when you worship. You can cry, you can scream, you can fall, don't mistake some emotional experience for actual fear of God. Because I've known a lot of people that fall and shake and cry, and, but when they get up, they're still the same. Fear of God is not some working up. I'm not saying you need to raise your hand just to raise. I'm just saying that if you reverence God and fear God, there will be some physical and emotional involvement, but it will result in a life of holiness. 
So I don't think we need to take this to unhealthy places with dress codes and things like that because, you know, we fear God. We reverence God, so we dress this way. Okay, praise God. If that's what you want to do, so be it. But I've seen where this can be taken to unhealthy extremes. So what's a good starting place to reverence God in my life? Well, uh, this is what I tell people to do. What do you think you're going to do when you get to heaven and you see Jesus on the throne? What will be your posture? Will you just look at him and go, will you do this? What's up? Like, what will be your posture in worship at heaven? What will you be doing? How will you join in with the saints? How will you join in with the creatures that are around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come? What will be your posture? Will you sing with them? Probably. Yes? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. We, we, will you maybe extend a hand? Because I've, I've heard people say this. Well, that's just not my personality. I've seen you at your grandkids' t-ball game. I've seen you when you called an eight-pound bass. I've seen you when you killed... A 12 point. I've seen you when your, score, when your team scored a touchdown. Don't tell me it's not your personality. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So that's the problem. We treasure football. We treasure grandchildren as we should. We treasure, listen, we treasure those things. Therefore, we are expository in our expression toward them. The problem is you just don't treasure God. You don't treasure him. And pride... Pride is keeping you from treasuring the Lord. And it's trying to take your salvation. If you have it at all. So I tell people, you know, how should I worship? Well, how do you think you're going to worship in heaven? Will you dance? Will you sing? Will you yell? Will you bow? Will you kneel? Will you listen? Well, I'm not saying you have to do all of those every service. Just imagine yourself before Jesus. And if your mind or your body tells you to do something, then don't hold back. Reverence him. Reverence him. Don't think about the person to your left and don't think about the person to your right and don't think about the, they're not, they don't care. And listen, if there's anybody in this place looking at you, then they got their own issues. The only person I'm concerned about when I'm worshiping, what does he think? I'm not doing it for me. I'm not coming in to worship for me. So give him your body, give him your mind, and don't get proud. That's a good place to start. The second manifestation of someone who doesn't fear God is you use God's name in vain. And I don't mean cussing. I mean, you shouldn't do that anyway. It's just ignorant. I mean, seriously. Let's grow up. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. And again, a lot of people think saying God before a cuss word or God after a cuss word. Again, that's not wise. <laughs> I think it's ignorant. I don't think anybody should say, oh my God, if you're not talking to him. I mean, does anybody walk around saying, oh my Judy? Or oh my Matt? Why, 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 would he, why would we use his name like that? It's a reverent name. I was playing golf one time and a guy slipped one. It was, I think it was actually GD. I thought I knew the guy. <laughs> but he looked directly at me. Right after he said it, he looked at me and said, I'm Pastor, I am so sorry. I'm so, I said, my name ain't God. You didn't cuss me. You should talk to him. Right? <laughs> but for a more mature crowd, I think you are, there's subtle ways that we misuse God's name. For if, if, if you ever use God's name for your own selfish gain, that's misusing his name. And a lot of times we will leverage his name in order to get something that we want from people. All right, so... Uh, you know, in my house, 
if one of my kids wants something, they'll come, they'll come to me and say, hey, will you tell them to do that? And so sometimes I'll send one of them with a message from me, and it usually gets done, right? Dad said, clean up your room. Now, if that, ca- if that child walks in the room and says, um, hey, you need to clean up your room. I said so. There's going to be a fight, you know? This is how it is. Rightfully so. But if they use my name, it usually re- results... Well, listen, sometimes i found that my kids will use my name without my permission. <laughs> Dad said so. Did he? Does that ever happen in y'all's world? Or the boss said so? It even happens around here. Pastor Matt said so. Eh, maybe. Maybe not. You should probably email me if somebody told you that. But sometimes we do it with the Lord. I had a dream. People will say this. I had a dream and God told me. Did you actually have a dream? Well, maybe it wasn't a dream. Maybe it was a, a vision. Did you have a vision? Well, maybe it wasn't a vision. Maybe it was an impression. God told me, be careful before you say, God told me. This happens in charismatic world all the time. I have a prophecy for you. God told me to tell you this. Like, well, okay, okay. Are, are you really trying to help this person? Or are you trying to leverage the name of God to get attention? Are you trying to get something that didn't come from the Lord? So a lot of people want to use God's name to make themselves famous or to get something out of someone. Just be careful with that. But also be careful with using his name to get things that your selfish and you know, your selfish ambition or your flesh wants. You know, false prophecy is not just bad preaching. It's anytime we misuse or abuse God's word to lead people in a direction of our desire, not his. That's false prophecy. It's actually witchcraft is what it is. Okay? So just be careful with using God's name. All right, last thing is you might not fear God. You probably don't if you tolerate sin. If you tolerate sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Look at that. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear, of the fear of the Lord or the fear of God. So holiness cannot be an option for you if you do not fear God. Okay? It's part of your sanctification process is to rid your life of sin, to rid your life of things that defile the body, but also don't respect the Lord. And so I, according to Scripture... You cannot tolerate sin, indulge in sin, and fear God. You cannot fear God while indulging in sin. It's impossible. Um, you, You cannot be entertained by immorality and fear God. You can't be sitting there watching things that Jesus had to die for and fear God at the same time. You can't. And, and, and this is what I hear. Well, this doesn't affect me. It affects God. Maybe you shouldn't be thinking about you. Maybe you should be thinking about God. I know this is tough. You can't have sex with people that aren't your spouse and fear God. You can't lust upon people that aren't your spouse. And fear God. You can't look at pictures of people and think things that aren't pure and fear God. You can't, you, you can't gossip and fear God. You can't be jealous and fear God. What can I do and fear God? Be holy as he is holy. <gasps> well, I just, think, I just think some of these things are okay. Well, well, you've been deceived. Well, I don't think I'm being deceived. No one who is being deceived knows that they're being deceived. It's kind of the definition of the word. Nobody's walking around saying, I think I'm being deceived right now. I don't know about what, but I just feel deception. (laughs) 
Go read all the scriptures about the end times. People will be walking in deception. People will be walking in sin. People will be lovers of self and money and lust and material things. People not taking God serious. Like this is all prophesied about. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, In the last days, people will reject sound doctrine. What the Bible says, and instead suit to suit their own desires, they will gather around teachers who will say whatever their ears want to hear. But this is where we are. We, we pretend like we're not going to be held accountable. We pretend like we're not going to stand before God. We, we pretend like it's okay to take his grace for granted. We pretend, we pretend, we pretend, but we're being deceived. Okay, enough. So what does it look like to fear God? I think it's really simple. Are you ready? Simple answer. You're going to be unimpressed with this answer. You really are. Some of you are leaning in. Or what does it look? I want to fear God. What does it look like? You're going to be unimpressed. Obey him. Obey him. Hate what he hates and love what he loves. Hate what he hates and love what he loves. I fear my wife. I hate what she hates and I love what she loves. It's one of the first things I learned in marriage. Hate what she hates. Oh, she doesn't like that. All right, I ain't gonna do that. Love what she loves. Hey, but all kidding aside, hate lies. Like God hates lies, he says it. So don't even get near a lie. Don't even bend the truth. So hate lies. Hate sexual immorality. Hate addiction and debauchery. Hate it, hate it. There's lots of things that God says that he hates, so learn to hate like, ooh, no. My father hates those things. But I'll tell you what he loves. He loves the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, self-control, peace, love. Love what he loves and hate what he hates. And if you'll just learn to get in that rhythm, good things are in your future. I promise you, the eyes of the Lord are looking for these people. They're hard to find. They're really hard to find. And he wants to bless you. He wants to pour his favor out upon you. But I think a good foundation of this life, kingdom life, is a healthy fear of the Lord. Amen? All right, stand up. So just a confession to you. Um, this, this, this message was preached to me first. You know, most of the messages that I give you, I have to deal with it first. So I've done most of these things, you know? I've, I've allowed pride to get in the way. I've allowed flesh to get in the way. And so I'm not up here by any means standing before you a person that has a perfect fear of the Lord. But I want to get better. I want this in my life. And if you want this in your life, you know, I think there's a few re responses that you can take today. I think that responses are good. I really do. I think that verbalizing to God, I, hey, I, amen, I get this. Thank you for loving me enough to communicate this. But I think there's two responses that I think we'll hit home today. It's, it's, the first one is, I think God has made known by his spirit today that if you are outside of his grace, like you're not saved, I think he's made that known today. And it, it may have manifested in a few ways. You may have felt it in your chest. You may have felt it in your heart. You may have felt it in your spirit, honestly. And God, do you remember when you got saved? I mean, I do. I remember my heart was beating like 100 miles an hour. I just felt the spirit of the Lord within me saying, come home, child, come home. I don't want you to be disappointed. Come home, come home. And so I think that the spirit of the Lord is leading people to repentance for the first time today. But, but, but similarly, I think that God is leading people to repentance for the second time today. So listen, there have been times in my life where I've slid away from the Lord, where I have, I have not respected him, where I've strayed. There have been times where God had to call me back. And, and aren't you glad that he did? So I think he's calling some people back today. Like, I think he's saying this, like we started the message. Hey, it's time to get serious. 
things are getting serious out there, I need you to get serious because I want to bless you and I want to use you. And I want to, listen, I want your children, I want your children to grow up with this healthy fear of the Lord. It may not cost us our life, but it may cost us their lives. There's a lot at stake. So I think a response today is obviously giving your life to Jesus, maybe coming back to the Lord. And a lot of the times that happens, well, all the times in scripture, it comes with the confession. Just coming in and saying, hey, will you pray with me? I wanna make this decision. And so our prayer team is gonna be here today. And the way that we do salvation is we don't get you to raise your hand or check. Let's just come and pray with somebody. Say, hey, I wanna know God. I wanna I want pray with somebody to accept Jesus Christ. Come and pray with one of these individuals. There's gonna be people coming for other reasons. Just come and pray. And we'd love to walk you in that process of knowing the Lord. You may, you may just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here to get serious. I wanna pray with you, I'm, I'm ready to get serious. And by walking forward and making that declaration, some powerful spiritual things happen within you. Maybe your body is not in line with what the word of God says. You've got a diagnosis. There's healing every single week here. Come and, come and receive that your soul's not right. I just don't feel like myself. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's depression. Then you're being oppressed by an evil spirit, according to scripture. Good news, Jesus died to set you free. So come receive freedom this morning. If you want just more of the Lord for this season that we're in, come receive prayer. So prayer team, come forward. Ushers, come forward. We'll close out our service by singing a quick, quick chorus of a song that's very relevant for today's topic. And as we begin to sing, come, 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 come and receive what God has for you this morning. I want you to bow your heads. Father, we just thank you so much in the name of Jesus for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for reminders. We thank you for wake up calls. We thank you, God, for just helping us get serious. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you move in this time of ministry in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that you redeem, restore, save, deliver all of this so that Jesus can be the recipient of the rewards of his suffering. To him be the glory, to him be the praise. Take the gifts that are about to be given, use them for the advancement of your kingdom. Use them to lead as many people as possible into a personal and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And everybody said it good. Amen. Let's sing.